church we believe in God The one and only true God who sent his only son To die for all of humanity So that we might be saved We believe in the Bible Every word on every page We are not a perfect church But in fact, we are a group of imperfect people Living for perfection We believe in a perfect love that casts out all fear So our mission is simple To love Love with no limits, no boundaries No exceptions made and no corners cut we believe that only light can drive out darkness and only love can drive out hate. And yet our church, the person you were to define the person that you become. We believe that his mind was focused on the one he sent, his only son. At our church, we believe that God is who he says he is. And at our church, we reject no one and accept no one and everyone. We believe in taking chances, risking it all, just so that one more person might find the true meaning to this life. We believe in dreams, but more importantly, we believe in you. We are more than a church, we are a family of brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers that have been forever changed by love. We believe that it's His love that brings life and His truth that sets us free. We believe that life is precious and every day is an opportunity. At Fearless Church, we believe that nobody is ever too far gone. They're always within someone's reach. At our church, we believe in having a relationship with God, an honest and real relationship with the Creator of our destiny. We are a church of sinners, saved by grace. We believe that Jesus died not to make bad people good, but to bring dead people to life. And at Fearless Church, we believe that creation deserves to meet its Creator. So this, this is an invitation to the destined about their destinies. An invitation to change history forever. An invitation to join us on this journey as we fearlessly love the city of Los Angeles. This is Fearless Church. I will not be moved, no, no. Time to go. Uh, I, I want to continue uh, in, in this uh, thought that we are thinking. And oh, by the way, the uh, Sarah and David's family are all here. Can they all stand up? All of Sarah and David's family in the back, in the right, in the left. Come on. <clears throat> and if you don't know who Sarah and David are, um, they are the, the campus pastors of this church, of this campus. Um, me and my wife are the lead pastors. I got to get that right. Last time David got on to me because I was, he said I was saying I was like the janitor. I'm, no. Uh, so, uh, and so, hey, we all do it all here, right? We're, but we love David and Sarah. And these guys came down because as you could see, Sarah was up here and uh, she is very pregnant. Um, that extra was not, was not COVID supplies that have been, you know, uh, was not the COVID 19, right? Uh, it, it was, it was, it's the baby that's coming. Miss Harley. Yesterday I said Haley and David correct me, Harley. And I said, oh, I'm sorry, Dave. No, I'm not gonna call her whatever I want. Harley, what a cool name. So we love you guys. Thanks for coming down. These guys are longtime friends and family and uh, we honor you guys. Isn't this awesome what God is doing? I, I wanna, I wanna jump right into this. Uh, this sermon series. Do you remember what the sermon series is called? What's it called? I love my church. And this is, this is not really something that we made up or something that uh, Jeremy is saying alone. We are just echoing what God himself has said about this thing called the church. In fact, Jesus, when he first spoke it into the atmosphere, uh, I believe the, 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 the alarms went off in hell. I believe um, the devil got nervous because when he started first talking about the church, he started talking about this authority that was coming back to the people of God. Now Jesus, as you see his life, he walked with authority. He, he, was, he was an author. Uh, my, my friend Jacques here uh, used to fly on the plane uh, that was the plane that uh, had the authority to issue the president's button for a nuclear attack. And he was telling them about this authority that they had. And they would fly along the coast, an unmarked plane. Jacques, wave, your, wave everyone so you can see this, this mighty, I don't know if you were a captain or a general or you were up there. To be on that plane, you gotta be a boss. And so, uh, so he was telling me that, that the president, it's not a button, it's a key that he has to turn. And then on the plane, there's a key that has to turn. And then somehow, I can't explain it, it's very amazing how it happens. And then there's another key on a submarine that has to turn. There are three keys that turn. And, 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 and how crazy is that Jesus, Jesus gives us the keys to the kingdom. In other words, that authority that you guys had under authority to give authority 
is the same picture as the body of Christ that when the head issues an attack on the enemy, when the head issues an attack on that fear in your life, that we are literally backed up by heaven. The Bible says this, whatever you loose in heaven, uh, then I, whenever you loose on earth, I loose in heaven. And what, whatever you bind on earth, I bind in heaven. In other words, God gave the church the keys or the authority. And then this authority is powerful. Why, does it, why do I need this authority? Because he says, not even the gates of hell will overcome the church. Now, if there's gates and there's walls, we've ran into them. But it doesn't matter how big the devil builds his gates and walls. If we have the keys, then we're good. And that key represents authority. You have authority. Adam and Eve didn't just lose, like, their, their ability to hang out in the garden. And they didn't just sin. They lost their authority. Adam lost his authority. Adam was the one who named all the animals. You know, that's why we got some animals that named weird things. And maybe Eve got in there and helped him a little bit. I don't know. Hippopotamus was probably hard to spell. And, you know, but then we got fly. You know, I mean, how, how crazy did that get? Adam had authority over the garden. He was the steward of the garden, but he lost that. And Jesus came as the second Adam. And then, then who are we? We're the second bride. Right? The first bride, Eve, God said it's not good for man to be alone. God put Adam to sleep. He opened up his rib. That's why men like ribs. Amen? <laughs> Stupid joke. It's not in my notes. It's just, it's just in my head. Every time I say that, I have to say that's why men like ribs. It's just a part of the sermon. He pulled Eve out of, out of Adam, form, formed her out of his rib. Look at the second... The second Adam, Jesus, who came, Adam failed at a tree, Jesus died at a tree. When they pierced Jesus' side, blood and water flowed out of his rib section. This, this, we, we were formed, the church, the bride, the second bride came from the same place. So, so here we are, we've been given authority. We've been given authority. God, God is really trying to bring back the garden, if we could look at it like this. He's trying to bring back, really, God, that's why he tore the, the curtain from top to bottom, not bottom to top. He was already on the top. He didn't go start from the bottom. Now we're here. He, he was here. He ripped the curtain from top to bottom. No man was the one who had this idea. It was God himself who had the idea, I want to be close to you. I want to invite you into my presence. See, see, see Eden is not really a location. It's an atmosphere. You know, they found everything, right? They found the ark. They're finding scrolls. They've, they've, they found all, you can go watch history channels. Even secular society can tell you, oh, here's the ark. Here's where it was. We found pieces of it. They, they proved the Bible through finding, but they've never found Eden. Why have they never found Eden? Because Eden is not a place, it's an atmosphere. And so, so when, when Jesus came back, he died to give us that ability to be in that atmosphere of the presence of God. That's why we're so consumed with, God, we want to be in your presence. We long to be in your presence. That's why when we gather here together, God says, we're two or three are gathered together in my name. Guess what? Eden happens. I'm there with them. I'm in their presence. This is our ultimate goal. This is our ultimate pursuit. This is our ultimate passion. Because everything makes sense in Eden. Everything changes in Eden. Everything, when we get in the presence of God, that's all that matters. I've spent most of my life in the presence of man. But, but my, my ultimate de desire needs to be, I want to get in the presence of God. You know, many people do a lot of things to be in certain people's presence, right? Oh, this celebrity's here. I just got to be in their presence because maybe they'll see me. Maybe they'll notice me. Maybe, they'll, maybe that clothing designer that I love will like the clothing that I design. If I could just get in his presence, if I could just be seen, but yet we don't fight to get in the presence of God. We'll stand outside in a line for hours to get in the presence of an athlete or a celebrity, and that's all fine. But, but what I'm saying is, what if we started fighting to get in the presence of God? What if we, we and, and, and you're saying, why do we have to fight for it? We have to fight our flesh that wants to run from the presence of God and our shame and our, right, and our condemnation. See, God doesn't bring condemnation. He brings conviction. Conviction and condemnation are, are different. Conviction draws you closer to the heart of God. You say, God, I, that's not who I am. 
That's, I looked at that, but that's not who I am. I'd landed there, but that's not who I am. And so it draws you closer to the heart of God. The devil wants to tweak it and he wants to push you away from God. And so what we're here to do is to, is to draw our hearts closer to God together as his family. And his church is the place where he acts, he moves, he thinks, he fills everything. That's why we're excited about giving out 2 million pounds of food because we're the hands of Jesus. Not because we're some social justice crew. We, we love social justice, but, but we're, not, we're here to be the hands and feet of Jesus, whatever that means. We're here to be his hands and feet. And when we're his hands and feet, we bring his presence to hurting people. We, we meet people's physical need before they ever let us meet their spiritual need. Some of you are maybe here today because you got some food in a food line and you say, wow, I can't believe a church actually cares about me not having food. And today I want to be a part of this. Are you heard about it? You say, man, I want to be a part of a church that looks like Jesus's hands and feet because that's the ultimate thing we're called to do. Jesus himself loves his church. So as millennials and Generation X and and whatever generation you're a part of, we can't be against his church and hate his church and despise his church and run from his church and say we love Jesus. I know I'm preaching to the choir because you're here at church. But, But if you've seen that today, raise your hand. You see people hate on his church, despise his church, not want to be a part of his church. And if you're not raising your hand, you either just don't want to be embarrassed or you just haven't been looking. Because the reality is, church hurts. And people in church sometimes hurt me. And, and so I'm going to run from the church. I'm going to hide from the church. And so I feel like this is something that needs to be said right now. That, that we need to fall in love with being his church, his bride again. Um, I want to read you a few things. Because we know that those that are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish. We talked about that. And, and there's this moment where Jesus, um, let's go to Hebrews first, actually. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. Uh, I, I see that we have that up there. And it says this. It says, let us consider. Somebody say Consider. So this is something you should be thinking about. I should be thinking about. This is, this is uh, in the book of Hebrews. He's, he's teaching us, if you're going to consider anything, here's what I want you to consider. Because as, as believers, we got a lot of thoughts about everything, right? We got thoughts about the book of Revelation. We got thoughts about, you know, uh, theology. We got thoughts about how this should be and that should be. But God said, if, if I want you to consider something, here's what I want you to consider. Here's, here's what I want you to put your mind on. Here's some deep thoughts. For, for all those that are so deep that you're drowning. Here, here's, some, here's, here's some things you need to put your heart on. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Let us consider, let, let's take some time to think, how can I stir, how can I stir Zach up to love and good works? Let's take some time to consider how can I stir Devon up to love and good works. I, God say, look, here's what I want you to do, church, bride. I want you to take some time to consider how you can stir each other up. How, hey, let's say like this, how you can fire each other up. How, how you can encourage each other. I, I want you to take some time to stir each other up to love and to doing something for me, to good works to feeding the homeless, to clothing the naked, to loving the hurting, to to honoring the broken. I want you to take some time how you can help each other not quit in the process, not give up on love, not walk away from from the hope that Christ left here called the church. I want you to take some time. And then number 25, you say, well, how do you know he's talking about the church? Well, let, let me read you 25 just to make sure in context we can see that he's talking about the church. He says, not neglecting to meet together as it is the habit, <laughs> right? We got a lot of habits. 30 days creates a habit. That is the habit for some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Look at that word, encouraging one another. You know that that's the word that God gave me this year? Encouragement? No, no, courage. 
that our word would be courage. Did you know it's going to take courage for us to do this? It's going to take courage for us to even consider it. I mean, I'm not even talking, God's not even telling you to do it yet. He's saying, would you just start with considering? <laughs> would you just, because you haven't, because you're in the habit of running from these people because that person hurts you, this person left you, they said this and they didn't, be, they weren't this. But, but would you consider, would you consider giving it a second shot? Would you consider believing again? Would you consider that I'm bigger than your hurt? I'm bigger than your offense? Would you consider that, that it's going to be worth it on the other side of this to stir each other, to encourage each other? Why did God give me this word courage? Because I believe that with, this, with COVID came a spirit. Because God didn't send it, so it had to be carried by some spirit. Oh, it happened in the lab. Oh, no, it happened at the Wuhan market. Oh, it happened. No, no, it, it didn't come from that. It came from a spirit. A spirit carried COVID into this place. And, and if you haven't felt that spirit, you haven't been alive. Because when I had COVID, that spirit was hanging over my room. That spirit was telling me I was going to die. That spirit was telling me I wasn't going to make it. That spirit was telling me that, that, that my family's going to catch it. And that spirit, it, it's called the spirit of fear. And here we are, the fearless church. Here we are, the fearless church. Okay, good, four of you. Here we are, the fearless church. Okay, one, one more time. Here we are, the fearless church. Look, either it's just the name or it's who we are. So when the spirit of fear rises, it's only because God has already sent something that the devil's afraid of. Let me say it this way. The devil's never acting, he's just reacting. If he was acting, he would be God. It's God who acts and the devil who reacts. So God, seven years ago, said, I'm going to send a church called Fearless to LA. It's going to be multicultural in who it is. It's going to be pursuing of the presence of God. And the devil says, well, I got something called COVID coming now. And I'm going, to dis I'm, going to, I'm going to separate that church. I got something called racism I'm going to send to this church. I'm going to separate this church. I'm going to make people believe, oh, you can't have a white pastor and be a part of this church. I'm going to make people believe they used to sit together, they can't sit together anymore. They can't love on each other anymore. Well, I came to serve notice on the devil and let him know that the fearless church was here long before all this... And we're going to do exactly this. We're going to reconsider. We're going to consider, how can I stir my brother to faith? How can I stir love in his heart? How can I, how can I do this? And, and, and the moment we stop doing this, and the moment we embrace, we embrace the fear of running away, we become religious. We become exactly what Jesus came to do away with. Jesus came to fulfill the law because the religious were pretending like they could, but couldn't. He ends up calling the religious Pharisees a whitewashed tomb. He said, you're like a tomb, those whitewashed tomb. You look great on the outside, but on the inside, there's decaying, dead, rotting stuff. They would come out and they would pray big prayers in front of everybody and they, they, they would parade around in their outfits while looking down on others. Funny thing is we still have these people. You usually find them on Instagram or TikTok, at least it's where I find them. No one really has the guts to be like that to my face, they just like to type like that. They'll be here this week, they'll be here tomorrow, they'll be here the next day. Two weeks ago, they couldn't believe I wore a hat and preached. Three weeks ago, they couldn't believe that I wore camo pants and preached. I thought I'd just get a camo hat and wear it together and <laughs> let an alma preach anyways. But what about the scripture, don't cover your head in church? Well, it was a cultural thing. You gotta read the Bible in context. 
You got to understand this stuff. It was a cultural thing that they were covering their head because they didn't think God should see them. They were hiding like Adam and Eve in the garden with the fig leaves because they weren't holy enough. God said, look, take off your hat. Look, I see you. I love you. He was saying, unveil yourself. But yet, oh, don't preach with a hat on. I said, so, so are you okay with me being a preacher up here and not down here? So that's a better option, right? So, so when I go to the store and, and I'm cursing and I'm uh, angry at the person and I just, and I, and I steal something and they go, oh, I thought you were a pastor. Oh, oh no, only on the stage am I a pastor? Because that's where I got to take off my hat, right? That's where I got to be perfect. Out here, I don't have to be. And so what I realized is I'm a pastor on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and I'm also a child of God all those days. So shouldn't I be the same guy up here as I am down here? But religion tells us you got to dress like this, look like this, sound like this. No, no, I want to be like him. I want to be more like him. So does that mean I wear sandals and a robe? I already got the hair. This is the spirit of religion. The spirit of religion. Oh, I can't go up there. Okay. Spirit. It doesn't like me, that spirit of religion. Look, if, 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 we, if we bring re religion into this family, what religion, it's, it's, the, it's the anti of relationship. Because religion seeks to be perfect so that you could be loved. And relationship knows that you gotta be vulnerable to be fully loved. Because look, you don't really love me if you only love perfect me. Because that isn't me. That's half of me. 10% of me. But the other half is who I really am. You see, the Pharisees, God, God confronted them. Remember this moment he's going into town and he's about, he's, he, it's right before the moment where he flips over the tables in the church. You remember that? That's, that's crazy Jesus. We're like, wow, that's crazy Jesus. I don't. But there's this moment right before that you might miss. He's passing a fig tree and he looks at the fig tree and the Bible says that he's hungry. And so Jesus leaves the crew and he goes over to the fig, fig tree and, 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 and he digs his hand into the fig tree and there's no fruit there. And the disciples just see Jesus doing this. You know, it's, it's, not a, it's not a Bible scripture yet. It's not, it's not a part of the story. They just see him go over. He's hungry. He's going to the vending machine called the fig tree. And he, he puts his money in and he, and he presses the button and nothing comes out. He reaches his hand past the leaves and, 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 and nothing's there. In other words, this tree is out of order. Uh, it's out of order. He, it, it promised one thing and didn't deliver. Why do you say that? Because any tree, any fig tree with leaves was telling you that something else was already developed. Because the first thing that develops on a fig tree is not the leaves, it's the fruit. So if there are leaves, it already has the fruit. So what this tree was doing, it was advertising something it didn't possess. And so Jesus goes to the fig tree and he curses it. Never will anyone ever eat of you again. And just walk off. I mean, Jesus is just talking to trees. <laughs> Disciples are like, what's happening with this guy? Curse it. They go back, they go into the temple and, and they go to Beth Page, which means home of the unripe fruit. And he goes into the temple and he sees all these people selling things, uh, you know, making money off the people coming. Now you say, well, pastor, we have a coffee shop. Yeah, coffee tastes really good, and God made it. I love it. <laughs> Pastor, we sell t-shirts. This is not the picture here. He wasn't mad because they were selling something. He was mad because they turned the whole house into a whole different thing. These people were there 
to get what they could from the people that were coming. They were using their hurt and their wounds and their sin, and they were selling them uh, penance. In other words, they were selling them lambs so that they could sacrifice and get it right with God. They were, they were manipulating people and, 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 and using their hurt and their pain and their wounds. And Jesus said, nope, this is not my house. This is not the house of God. And he starts flipping. I mean, Jesus, if there's anything that Jesus was violent against, it was religion. He's flipping over tables. He makes a whip and he starts whipping people out. You know, I mean, how do you like, if I did that, there would be some Yelp reviews about this church. I would never do that, but I'm just saying, there's Jesus. I mean, like, this is crazy. People are running out and the disciples are like, what's going on? And Jesus begins to teach on relationship. He says this, my father's house will be a house of prayer. What is he saying? This is a place where we commune with the Father. This is Eden. This is where we have relationship with. This is not a place to come set up your stands to use and abuse people in this environment. This is, this is where we have communion. This is where we have relationship, not religion. And over and over again, the Pharisees were trying to trap Jesus because they were so stuck on religion because it was their religion that told them they were valuable. It was how many times they could recite the prayers and how many times they could live out the Ten Commandments. We know that Jesus didn't come to do away with the commandments. He came to fulfill them. In fact, the commandments are called the covenant. You know, we've been talking about this. We're not going to have a consumer community. We're going to have a covenant community. A consumer community is, as long as you make my coffee right, as long as you preach good, as long, as long as you say hi to me, as long as I get to be on the band in a certain amount of time, as long as you see me, notice me, love on me, believe in me, then I'm here and I'll bring my business here. Yet here we are, the generation's like, man, I, I hate church because it's so business-like, but then we bring our business to the church. You know what, it should be our business to be about the Father's business and say, you know what, God, we are here for relationship, and relationship is not, it's, it's, it's not this, it's not this, if you give me, I give you. I'm not here because I owe you something. I'm not preaching today because I owe you something. You don't owe me something. We're here today because we love each other, and we believe that this is what God designed, the church, and we're a part of that covenant. So Jesus comes, here's the covenant of the Ten Commandments. By the way, in the Ten Commandments, it does say, don't forget the Sabbath day and keep it holy. You know, that was in the commandments. We forget about that one. <laughs> Why did I say that? Because we're keeping, we're keeping the Sabbath for ourselves. But it's the Sabbath day we're keeping holy. But, but, but Jesus came not to erase the commands, but to fulfill them. In fact, when he sat down with the disciples, what does he tell them? In the Last Supper, he says, this is my new covenant. Here's the old covenant. Here's my new covenant. My blood will be poured out for you. My body will be broken for you. And here is how I'm going to fulfill the law that you couldn't fulfill. I know you were trying and you couldn't do it. So what do you do if you try and you can't do it? You cheat, you manipulate, you hide, you pretend. He said, you don't have to pretend anymore. I know. I look, I look, look. And then he starts talking about the Beatitudes. God gives the new Ten Commandments. Here he goes. He lays them out. He says, the first of these commandments is this. Love God with all your mind, soul, heart, and spirit. And then number two, love others as you love yourself. Then he gives all the ways we can be blessed. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are the humble. Blessed are the pure at heart. And then he starts going through all these things. He goes, look, I know it said don't murder, but I'm not really talking about murder because I don't just see the outside. I see the inside. Murder didn't start on the outside with that situation. It started in here. You know where murder started? It started when you got angry. And so if we're really going to talk about it, let's deal with the anger. And then who could hear could say, I've never been angry. None of us. He said, look, I'm not talking about don't sleep with your neighbor's wife. It started with lust. It started with that thought. That's the root of sin. That's the moment it came in. We're just taking care of the fruit and not taking care of the root. And so Jesus comes and he says, look, you couldn't fulfill the law. The covenant, 
look, this is not consumer. You started thinking this covenant was consumer. You were trying to honor me as the customer, and I'm too big of a customer. I desire too much food. I desire too many things. You cannot fulfill me. So Jesus came to fulfill God's desire. And he came and he lived a perfect, sinless life. That means Jesus didn't lust. That means Jesus never got angry. Jesus really lived the perfect life. And then he said, here's my new covenant with you. So here we are. We're in the new covenant. Or we call it the New Testament. You know what the word testament meant in their language? The deed, the title. God's saying, look, this book right here is not a book of rules. The New Testament, the next half, you know what it is? It's my title deed to your inheritance. It's the new covenant. My new covenant gives you an inheritance in the Father together as his family. And here we are worried about, man, if, I don't know if I can go to church because I'm not perfect yet. And there's not perfect people there. So do you want religion? So God cursed the fig tree because it was plastic. It was fake. It wasn't real. There's no roots in here. You know what's in here? Styrofoam. Where's the fruit? So here we are as believers because we haven't gotten planted and we don't want to be real and we don't want to let down our mass. Look, God can only do in you and me to the level we're willing to open our heart and say, I'm not perfect either. I don't have it down either. I'm, I don't, I don't, I, I, I still struggle with things. I'm still going through things. Yes, I'm an usher. Yes, I serve. Yes, I love God. But man, I'm struggling through some issues right now. I'm going through some frustration right now. And if you need me to be plastic, then this is not going to work. I remember a long time ago, someone said, man, we don't want a pastor who's not perfect. We want a pastor who's not still working things out. Sometimes I'll be honest with you in a sense. Hey, here's what I'm going through. Struggling through this. So, man, I want a pastor like that. I want a pastor that's got it together. I said, well, great. Well, then you have a pastor that's a liar. Which one would you like? The Bible says no one is righteous, not even one. We are all in this mess together. In fact, this is where the love of Jesus is proven and tested on each other. That doesn't mean someone hasn't hurt you in the church. That doesn't mean it was okay. But you're going to hurt someone too. And you're broken too. Oh, I want to read you a few more things because, because I'm just, Instagram has fired me up. All my friends on there have fired me up. And, um, you know, a, a, covenant, a covenant cannot be canceled because of failure of one of the parties. A covenant is, is, is not based on if you hold it up or I hold it up. It's solely based on responsibility where one party continues to do what they agreed on regardless of what the other does or not. I'm believing for a generation that would, that would begin to say, I'm going to have courage. And with that courage, I'm going to use it to encourage others. The Bible tells us our gifts, the apostles, the prophets, the teachers, the preachers were given to the body of Christ. Your gift was given to the body to build up the body, to encourage the body. It's going to take courage in these last days. We're going to have to let go of fear. We're going to have to let go of shame. We're going to have to let go of guilt. It's going to take courage in these last days for us to be able to encourage each other. There is someone next to you in this room that needs courage to be real. You mean if I be real, you'll still love me? If I let you in, you won't reject me. If I tell you what I'm really going through, you won't walk away. God is looking for a community to say, yes, we won't leave. Well, what about the verse, guard your heart, guard your heart. I've been guarding my heart, guarding my heart. You know what that verse is about? Not about you guarding your heart from others. It's about... <laughs> guarding others from your heart. Let me say that again. It's not about you guarding your heart from others. 
It's actually about guarding others from your heart. Because it's our heart that's wicked and evil. It's our heart that's a mess. I got to guard you from my heart. How do I do it? I put Jesus at the door of my heart. And he gives me peace. He helps me in what to say and what not to say. He helps. I'm not guarding my heart from you. Oh, I got I to gotta keep you out of distance because I got to guard my heart. Got to guard my heart. My heart got hurt last time. My, no, no, it's not about your heart. Your heart is the thing that hurts. So I got to guard you from my heart. My heart's crazy. Don't say that heart. Keep that quiet heart. Not the right timing heart. You need to take that before the Lord heart. That's how we have community. And when we get there, we begin to open our heart. Now we're building something. We're building something beautiful. We're building something with with this group of people. Romans chapter two, verse one says, those people are on a dark downward spiral, spiral. But if you think that leaves you high on high ground where you can point your fingers at others again. Every time you criticize someone, you condemn yourself. It takes one to know one. Judgment, criticism of other well-known, or, or, or well-known ways of escaping detection yourself in your own crimes and your own misdemeanors. But God isn't so easily diverted. He sees right through all your smoke screens and holds you to what you've done. You didn't think that, did you, that just because you point your finger at others, you would distract God from seeing all the misdoings in your own heart from coming down on you? Or did you think that because he's such a nice God, he'd let you off the hook? Better think one, that one through again. From the beginning, God is kind, but he's not soft. In his kindness, he takes us firmly by the hand and leads us into a radical life change. This one is for my Instagram religious haters. You know, You say something like, hey, God loves you anyways. Or God doesn't care about that. He loves you. You say, oh, God doesn't care. God doesn't care. I can't believe you say God doesn't care. He does care. You need to get your life right. You need to get your life straight. Yes, but he's not saying it like that. It's his kindness that leads us to repentance. It's his love. Look, come on. When someone's beaten down and just trying, some people are, some people in this room are barely here right now. They got high all the way to church. They're going to get high all the way home, and they're like, I don't even know what I'm doing here right now. This is crazy. God should probably kill me for being in this room right now. And I come and I say, God loves you. And then the religious person says, no, he doesn't. You need to tell him. You need to tell him. Get rid of your sin. Get rid. Yes. But it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. Not his anger. Not his a- God's not mad at you. He's madly in love with you. It's okay that you're messed up. All of us are too. That doesn't mean we leave pursuing who God is. That doesn't mean we stop becoming more like him. That doesn't mean we start learning how to be righteous and how to live this holy life. That means we grab by God by the hand and we say, God, thank you for being kind. Thank you for not embarrassing me. Thank you for not putting me on blast. Thank you for not uncovering my stuff in front. God, thank you, God, that you work with the brokenhearted. Thank you, God, that you see me. Thank you, God, that, look, while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me then. He wasn't waiting till I. He forgave me before. You know, we only forgive when. I'll forgive you when you got a lot of stuff to do, then I'll forgive you. See, we always put, put our, who we think on others. So, so we think, oh, God's like us. No, God's not like you. He doesn't forgive when they get it right. Forgiveness is released because of his power. Repentance happens over here. He forgave me before I was even born of the things I would do. When I was 18, I finally repented and walked in that forgiveness. I don't care where you're at today. And then someone say, oh, you don't care where I'm at? No, no, I don't care where you're at in comparison to where you're going. 
God has big plans for you. The religious, they paraded themselves around and they even found wrong in Jesus, which he had no wrong in him. If all you do is constantly find wrongs in others, you may be walking more like them and less like Jesus. It's time we look in and we say, God, I need to work on this heart. I'd love to work on you, maybe in a couple years, but I still got a plank hanging out of my eye. I'd love to get that speck, but I'm, I man, this plank is big. I'm still working on me. I'm still growing. I'm still being shaped. Not that I will never help you, but right now, I'm not looking for how everybody else is wrong. I'm looking in and saying, God, thank you for leading me with kindness. Thank you for meeting me where I'm at. Thank you in my plasticness. You didn't curse me, but you loved me and you believed in me. See, this community, we have to be courageous. We have to be courageous. God is making something beautiful. He is creating something beautiful. We have to be courageous. God is, is making a milkshake. He's creating something amazing. He's got our chocolate and our light chocolate and even some marshmallows in here. Praise God. <laughs> He's making a milkshake out of Fearless. He's making something that tastes different than it started as. He's putting us together piece by piece, element by element. This is some good stuff. This is Ben and Jerry's fish food. And it just tastes amazing. I don't know why it's called fish food, but it's got chocolate, ice cream with gooey marshmallows, swirl, chocolate, and fudge. And it's all of 1,100 calories per container. Wow. Sheesh. <laughs> I, was on, I was on the rower last night. Oh, God. I was on the rower last night, and I was like, man, this, I must have burned like 1,000 calories. I looked up, it was 10. I can't even smell that right now. If I smell that, I gain 10 calories. We're in trouble. God's, this is what God's doing. He's making something beautiful. He's a chef. He's cooking something up for, to feed the world through fearless. And I believe it's sweet, salty, and all the above. I believe he's, he's putting some peanut butter in there. Come on, who likes peanut butter in their ice cream? Only three of us? Come on, some of, some of you people that are like Okies like me, you like that peanut butter in there. At least a few scoops. You got to put more. And then you got to get some milk in there, some reduced fat, hopefully, uh, to, to make up for all the, the fish and Jerry's fish food there. And so, so God's mixing it in. He's mixing it in, just, just enough. So it's still, still smooth, just enough right there. And he's making this beautiful picture. And, and he's inviting the world. He's saying, look what I'm doing at Fearless. And I got to put some chocolate chunks in there. We got any chocolate chunks in the house? Come on. Come on, baby. We got some chocolate chunks up in there. And, and so, so God's making something. He's, he's blending something. He's, he's perfecting something. He, he's, come on, he's putting on high. He's, he's, uh, he's mixing us up. Sometimes when we get together, it's a mix up. It's, it, you know, what's in you becomes a part of me. And, and God's, God, see, at the end of this, you, you look nothing like what you used to be and you start looking like each other. See, that, that's the key. He's blending something together. Together. He, he's putting some, th some flavors. To, look, it's okay that you're only the only flavor of you. We need you in the mixture. See, God is putting all the fearless flavors together, and he's making something beautiful. Come on, I, I don't know who's here that would really like a, a taste of this. Uh, David, you got to give me some cups. I got I to let some people try this. I got to let some people try this. Who, who thinks this might taste pretty good, this fearless concoction that God is making up? And as David's getting me the cups, as David's getting me the cups, this tastes good. And, 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 and listen, I'm not going to take a drink of it because then you won't drink it because of COVID. Uh, but I'm just saying, I, I want to give some people a, a shot of this because this is the fearless flavor. Uh, but, but then, but, but, but then, then what happens is we go, this is awesome, God. Thank you for this. All this, all, the, all this, this is, this is amazing. Uh, but, but I, I'm bringing some other stuff along. I, I like this, but I'm just going to I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be here in this relationship, but I'm going to add a little fear into my relationship so that, so that, you know, I don't screw things, you know, because last time I got screwed up because someone hurt me and they manipulated me and they, they messed me up. And so I'm just going to bring a little healthy, we call it healthy fear, healthy uh, boundaries. This, this, I'm going to be in the body, but, not, but, but I'm going to have healthy boundaries with each other. And, and I get it, but I don't get it. So we bring in a, little, a few more ingredients. Um, this would be great, but, but God, I have a few. Can you bring me in that fear? Thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll take that fear. Okay, good. We're going to add this to this. Uh, Tyrone, come here real quick. Come here. Because uh, I don't want to. It's 
tell you what it is, I need to. That's right. Uh, will you tell me what, what you think this ingredient is? Come on, just close your eyes and smell. Dog poop? <laughs> what, what'd you say? Uh, it doesn't smell good, dog poop. Maybe dog poop? Yeah. Okay, good, yep, uh, you're right, you're correct. But it could be, it could be people poop because we found it outside. Um, we're unsure, thank you Tyrone, thank you, appreciate it. So we're just gonna add that fear. Thank you, Chris, thank you. Uh, we're gonna add that fear to fearless. All right, we're gonna add that fear, that, that, that you know, we, we gotta, we gotta, let me, let me ask you this. <clears throat> let me ask you this. Put the glove on? Okay, I'll put the glove on. I'll put, I'll put the glove on. I'll, and, 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 that's, and that's exactly what God's saying. That's exactly what God's saying. God's saying, don't ruin it, fearless. I'm going to bring just, I'm going I'm to, you know, just protect, I'm going to bring a little religion, a little plastic to the party. Thank you, God, for this amazing, pure thing you're making. Uh, but I'm going to, sorry, honey, I borrowed these from home. I hope that's, you want me to do it with my hand? Okay. We're just going to have to buy you a new pair. Hopefully these aren't expensive, right? So we go, okay, God, awesome. I love this community. I'm just going to bring a little of my religion, a little of my fake. Let me, let me ask you this. How much is too much fear? How much is too much religion? How much is too much plastic? Is, is it okay if we just lessen it? Like a lot would be really a lot. But like, what if we just do a pinch of the loaf? What if we just do a little? I mean, no big deal. Zach will still drink it. Just, what if we just, ooh, it's kind of, oh. Just a little, just a little, just a little. Okay. That one didn't have any corn in it. We'll find this one right here. Oh, oh. Oh. Oh my God, oh my God, what am I thinking? Oh. So glad you all came and brought all your fear and your anxiety. And... Oh, oh, let me go. Okay. All right. Whew. Cup. It's a cup. Oh, there's a chunk right there. Oh. I just don't know why the world doesn't want to be a part of the church. I just don't know why my friends don't want to come to the church. I don't know why my family doesn't want to be a part. I, I wish my mom would come and just realize how awesome this is. <laughs> Jesus did drink this for you but I'm not going to drink it for you. <laughs> if you knew how bad that smelled. Okay, I'll drink it. No, I'm just kidding. So, so let me ask you again, how much is too much? So like, it, it doesn't matter how much. So like any amount that we don't leave at the door, any amount that we don't get, look, the Bible says, the kingdom of God suffers violent, but the violent take it by force. Look, if you really cared about what I was making and someone tried to bring that in and you don't try to stop them, you don't say, hey, I love you, but we're checking that at the door. Hey, I love you, but we're leaving that offense there. Hey, I love you, but we're leaving that religion. Hey, this is how we grow together. Hey, you don't have to be perfect for me. That doesn't have to be included. I want the pure of who you are in the pure of who I am. And this is what the world, look, I wonder if a church actually started making milkshakes without the extras. What could happen in our city? What could happen in our world if a group of people got sick and tired of being like the Pharisees who couldn't even find good in Jesus? How crazy is that? Even Jesus, they're like, yeah, you didn't get it right. So can anybody get it right with that spirit? No. Until you realize how much God did for you, 
You'll always be judging somebody else. And we come in like this, oh, who's going to hurt me now? We should be going, man, I hope I don't hurt anyone. I hope I can, I hope I can just get this anger, give it to the Lord. I hope, I, God, I just, I want to give you this. Look, there's still parts of me that are fake. God, I need to, look, you are bringing the wrong ingredients. We need to leave those ingredients at the door. And we need to say, God, we're making something beautiful for our world. We're making something, we, we're going to, look, we are going to be, not be the fig tree that when God reaches in, there's nothing there. And you say, well, I got all these cuts. I got all these wounds. And God goes, great. I brought you to the right place. Your cuts and your wounds are what make you belong here. See, it's the cuts and the wounds in the puzzle that puts together the picture. If you're here, you're not here because you found a church on Google. Even if you found it on Google. You're not here because you found a church on Yelp. Even though you might have found it on Yelp. The Holy Spirit lit that page up. The Holy Spirit put something inside you and said, look, I've been looking for you. <laughs> they're, they're putting together an amazing picture, but without you, it doesn't come to pass. So, so I need all your brokenness. I need all your testimony. The Bible says, he that overcomes. God's going to give us right to eat at the tree. He that overcomes. Look, we need some overcomers here. We need some people that say, yeah, I got some pain. I got some problems. I got some stuff. If I could be real, uh, my, this person is, in, my family, certain parts of it are embarrassing. I got some addictions to things. But God, you know what? You brought me to the right house. And God, I'm a king's kid, even if I'm messed up. And here's all my brokenness, and I'm bringing it to the table. If you hold your life, you lose it. But if you give it to God. You might actually find it for the first time. And our hope today is that we would be able to say, I love my church. You know what we say when we say that? I love you in spite of everything that makes you, you. I love the imperfect you. I love the running you. I love the broken you. I even love the religious you. I love you enough not to leave you where you're at but to call you to a higher place, God's kindness. Have you experienced God's kindness? What if we started getting that kind of God kindness to others? Hey, I'm gonna lead you by the hand. I'm gonna love you enough, not to leave you where you're at, but not to beat you down. That stuff you landed in isn't you. That ingredient you brought, let's leave it there. And let's move on into what God calls the church, the beautiful bride. And by the way, the poop's still in the bag. It's just a trick. Leave the poop in the bag. That's the title of this message now. Leave the poop in the bag. Leave the poop in the bag. When you, when you tweet today, you say, my pastor preached a sermon called, leave the poop in the bag. All your friends will watch it. And that's what we need to do. And you're rough, you might say it different, right? Just leave, leave it in the bag. Leave it there. Leave it there and let's move on into His grace. Let's move on into… Look, the beauty of, of me being a pastor is not that I'm so perfect that I'm a pastor. The beauty is that I don't deserve to be a pastor. But God loves me anyways and empowers me and gives me grace and He made a new covenant with me. I can't fail in this thing and neither can you. Would you stand up with me all over this room? Praise God. Praise God. Well, I broke a plant, I blended up fake poop, all for you today so that this would make sense up here. Why leave this place exactly the same after getting all that? Today why not let God change us? Why not let's take out the plastic and let's say, man, God, if, if you take all the plastic out, my, my, my plant is only this big. I'm just barely growing, but I'm ready to grow. If you're here and say, man, I, I'm, I'm ready to just fall in love with the church again, the community that, that is, a, is a covenant community. I'm ready, I'm ready to release my fear, leave it at the door. I'm ready to step into the fullness of what God has in this beautiful thing. This, this, it's not an experiment. It, it, it's a test of his love. You ready to do that? I want you just to lift your hands all over this room and say, man, I'm just ready. I'm ready to leave religion behind. I'm ready to step into relationship. I'm ready to flip over the tables of, of, of the past and say, God, today we just, we just, we make, uh, we make a covenant with you. God, you made a covenant with us. We made a covenant with you. Lord, we promise. A covenant is a promise. 
God, we, we step out in courage, Lord, the, the anti of fear, and we leave fear behind, God, and we just say today, we just say this with me, dear Jesus, today we step into the fullness of your promise. We become the bride of Christ. We step into the family of God. God, we got broken things about us, but you're not afraid of that. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me. Thank you, Jesus, for bringing me into a family. Come on, thank you, Jesus, for loving me. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiving me. Thank you, Jesus, for bringing me into a family. And I pray right now, all that hurt, all that shame, all that all that religion, all that fear. God, we let go. We let go and we put our trust in you, Jesus. Lord, you set guard over our heart. You guard our heart. God, give us peace beyond the worry. Give us, give us faith beyond the fear, God. We pray, God, you would remove religion out of our heart. Lord, flip over the tables of our heart. God, we call, we call this Eden again. We ask you would give us authority in this place. You would give us power as your church. And Lord, when we bring the milkshake to people, God, Lord, we don't allow an ounce of fear in it. We don't allow an ounce of religion in it. God, we say no to that. And Lord, we say it is too precious what we are delivering to it, a hungry and a thirsty world. Lord, pour us out like you poured yourself out. Thank you, Jesus that you didn't add religion to you. Thank you, Jesus, that you didn't add fear to you. Lord, thank you, Jesus, that perfect love cast out all fear. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. But I pray new life, new life, new joy over your church. Come on, can we just sing this together? Can we just sing this together right there? Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Fearless, we're going to give to the Lord. There, there's no better way to worship Him than to give to Him, to give of our time, our talent, and our resources or our finances. It's all through the Word of God, one of the most uh, talked about subjects in the parables and from God's voice Himself is, is about finances because that's really attached to our hearts. And really, does God want our finances or does He want a heart? No, He wants our heart. So in order to get to our heart, sometimes we have to root out some of these things that are in the way. Money can be a huge thing. Now it's not, money is not evil, but the love of money can be the root of all evil. And so really God's going, hey, like, are you okay with, with just giving to me? He, he's going, God, God gave us all. He gave you everything. Can you give back that 10%? And really, uh, offerings are over and above. You know, Jeremy and I have, we used to do the 10%, that menial amount uh, that you do. And, and then there's a, a new level of faith and um, supernatural life that we begin to live when we begin to move into this level of giving offerings over and above. I'm telling you, you can never outgive God. You can't go, oh God, I gave too much. What are you gonna do? Did I, I, I got you now. No, 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 he's not, he's not twiddling his thumbs going, I don't know what to do now. They gave a lot of money. No, no, no. He, He's, he's figuring out how he can bless you, shock you with his goodness and his mercy through your giving. Um, as you continue to give, you can just be confident that what you're sowing into this ministry is good soil. And every week we are giving, doing three different outreaches in downtown Santa Ana and now in Crenshaw, a very needy area. Um, and and we, are, we are seeing so many people um, with tears in their eyes, thanking us from the bottom of their hearts because if we would not have done this, they have maybe not been able to eat or feed their family. So I just want to encourage you to continue to give. Up to today, we've given over a half a million pounds of food away. Up until now, from, from the beginning of this year when we started, this pandemic started in about March and we started doing this. We've given 43,215 bags out of groceries and we've impacted almost 135,000 people. 
that is, I, I, I believe right when I just said that, all of hell, heaven is, is celebrating and going in an uproar uh, shouts. And I, I'm so proud to be part of a community that believes in loving on a city. We will continue to love on a city until they ask why. And I thank you for continuing to partner to see God um, be, be revealed in the hearts of his sons and daughters. Let's continue to give, love more, and fear less. Wow, what an amazing word. We are so glad you guys were here with us today. Remember, if you're new, text FEARLESS to our FEARLESS number, and we hope you have a great rest of your day.